Done. Well, thank you all for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's a competitive world out there, so getting your friends and uh, art lovers to gather um, feels really good. And this is Patricia, and she's going to be recording the talk and uh, working with me later to do an edited version of it for my website, a short version of it for Instagram, of course. Um, so if you're okay with that, you know, she'll, she's going to be just panning across the room as well. And I thought that the format would be, and it's so intimate that you can, uh, if you have questions as I'm talking, please feel free to, um, to ask. Otherwise, I'll give you an overview of the show and then we can have more of a, a conversation um, about it. Um, and I thought I would start by telling you about the three whiskey rebellions that I'm referring to in this show. The first one was in 1794, the one that the history books talk about. And that one was our new nation was trying to raise money to pay for the war and all of the, you know, the needs of a new country. And so the government instituted a whiskey tax. Well, Western Pennsylvania farmers and distillers got very upset with that whiskey tax and started to fight back. And it became an early test of the government and George Washington sent troops to Western Pennsylvania to, squ to squash this rebellion. And you know, somehow in history, it became known as the Whiskey Rebellion and it was, it was a, a challenge and a test of our new government's uh, strength and uh, you know, conviction. So, uh, and we got through that hurdle obviously and the government went on and the centuries passed and then in the 1950s, the, the federal government instituted a new whiskey tax. Obviously, they didn't learn from history. And, um, but this time, in order to, to deal with that tax, companies like Jim Beam Whiskey uh, tried to outsmart the government. And instead of um, paying the tax, they started creating these commemorative decanters, which weren't taxed in the same way. So this was a way of them selling extra whiskey and avoiding the tax, but it also was a way of tapping into the post-war uh, baby boom era. And the, you know, the, like imagine the rec room bar in the basement of a suburban tract home. Uh, th these, these figures were very collectible, very desired, mostly by men. Um, so because it was a male audience, the figures skewed towards subjects that men would be interested in collecting. And I might add, probably mostly straight men and probably mostly white, straight, conservative men. I mean, I'm drawing some assumptions here, but uh, until proven wrong, I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> and um, one of the subjects that, that was selected were army war heroes, and in this particular case, revolutionary war heroes. Bill's godmother inherited a collection of some 300 of these bottles from her uncle Henny, who was one of these straight white guys who collected these things and had the rec room and the basement in suburban New Jersey. And when he died, uh, Aunt Arlene, or whatever, Arlene got, got these bottles and, um, and then they, she didn't do anything with them. They sat in her basement in boxes for a couple of decades until she uh, passed away this past January. And then Bill, as her executor, had to find homes for them all. So he showed them to me. And I mean, there was all 50 states. And there was Hollywood characters like Laurel and Hardy. And there were the Birds of America. And like all these series and travel icons. And, and among them were the heroes of the American Revolution. And these guys really spoke to me. Um, and they, sp it's, they spoke to me on a couple of levels. One was just purely camp. I mean, they're just delicious. They're <laughs> colorful and campy and glazed. And you know, I've always been attracted in my art to this tension between masculine and feminine. And on the one hand, they're very masculine. They're war heroes. On the other hand, they're so effete and, pl and playful and um, glazed and rouged cheeks and like there was this sort of tension between them that really spoke to me. And I, and I said, well, that's, those are the ones that I want and I'm going to do something with them. And it, at first I just thought I was going to, um, you know, do, do my thing, put some jewelry on them and, you know, camp them up and bring them to the 21st century that way. 
But then I felt like, well, I can't really, I can't just do that because these aren't anonymous figures. These aren't just plaster busts that I bought at a flea market. These are historical characters. And in order to really respect the process and the, and, and the, and the, the uh, objects, I need to do a little research. So I started actually reading about who, who is General Stark and who is Rochambeau and, and around this, and this all happened subsequent to Hamilton becoming the sensation that it was. And so I was never that much of a history buff, but I have to say Hamilton gave me a new vocabulary for appreciating uh, history and, and doing it in a way that layered the past and the present um, and historic, uh, the ethos of history and contemporary uh, vernacular and art and the hip hop and the, um, you know, the, the multicultural aspect of it and the, 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 the gender play, all of those things started to seep in as I'm reading about these historical characters. And I, and I saw how I could do something similar, but in using my vocabulary with this work. So the third Whiskey Rebellion was my own, where I'm challenging the fact that these figures are meant to represent heroes of American history. And I'm like, really? Are they really, hist are they really heroes? And you know, how, how do they feel about the issues of our day and that are so important to, to us and, and you know, our lives? Were they feminists? Did they, were, you know, could they, were, was there space for gay rights? What about black people? What about slavery? What about, you know, um, gun control? What, all of these things, I would imagine that their report card, they would be, you know, they get failing grades for all of it. And so I understand it was a different time. I understand that it's not really fair to judge, you know, people from past uh, generations on current values. But by the same token, it's also not okay to just ignore it. And so to just put fun necklaces on these guys was sort of missing an opportunity and missing my, you know, my responsibility and my uh, privilege as an artist to re to re uh, contextualize them and and bring them into the 21st century in a way that feels authentic and uh, and relevant for me and I hope for the audience. So that's that's how. I, I embarked on this project. And then I had to take a deep breath because it's not as easy as just throwing some beads on it. <laughs> I had to really think and, you know, and, and, and hunt for the objects that were going to communicate without words this transformation. So fortunately, most of you have been to my studio and you know that I uh, have 35 years worth of collected stuff. Uh, and I have it in multiple places. I have jewelry stuff in my jewelry business. I have art supplies uh, upstairs and in the storage area. And for me, art supplies are everything that my family doesn't want anymore and says, John, <laughs> do you want these? <laughs> and it's, um, you know, boxes and boxes and mementos and knickknacks and jewelry and um, you name it from uh, my father's parents, from my, my mom when she passed away, from my own, you know, years and years of, of savings, from um, my niece will give me a thing, Uncle Johnny, do you want this? <laughs> uh, every time I see my father, he's got a bag of old computer cables. Uh, you know, do you, you want some of these? I mean, it's really funny how everybody knows that I'll take that stuff. And, and I take it not as a hoarder, I take it as an artist. And, you know, that's my version of oil paints <laughs> or a very thoughtful hoarder, yeah. I'll own that. So I have, I have my jewelry supplies, I have my art supplies, and then um, at home I have a library. I actually live in a converted library, so books are a huge part of my, my life as well. And as I started thinking about the pedestals of these sculptures, I wanted the pedestals to be books. And again, the books couldn't just be random, they needed to be meaningful. And I use books as pedestals at home in a decorative way, so that vocabulary had already been established. And, and I should say that I, you know, in looking at these, these uh, decanters in the first place, the key elements that were ripe for reinvention were the pedestals, which, you know, in, in heroic sculpture, in, in, monu in monuments, uh, there's always a grand pedestal. So that was an area that I wanted to address. Then the military, 
decorations, the ribbons, the sashes, you know, these things, again, they're really on the cusp of, on the one hand, they're very macho, but on the other hand, they're very camp. Uh, you know, all of, that, all of that pomp and circumstance and shiny brass objects and buttons. So, you know, the embellishments and the, and the, uh, the war dec de decorations was a great area for me to, um, to question and to, to layer on with my own um, objects. So the books came from my library and I literally looked through, I have a section of business books. So you'll see there's a lot of business books um, mixed in, uh, a personal growth self-help section, uh, an LGBT section, and I would say those are the three core areas that I pulled books from. Um, but then I, I realized that, you know, there were certain things that I was, that I had the materials for to talk about, but there were others that were important to the dialogue that I didn't have. And one of the key ones was um, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and to, to talk about that moment in our culture. So for that, I started to go out to buy new materials. And I bought uh, buttons, political buttons, and uh, the kind of thing that you know people, the kids put on their backpacks or that we wear on denim jackets. Those were a, like a nice shorthand way of communicating these uh, concerns. I also bought some books. Uh, Crispus Atticus was. Uh, the, can you help me, Bill? Was he the? Uh, at the beginning of the war in Boston, that was uh, he the was first person killed, killed and he was the, black, right? The Boston Massacre. Uh, I have the book right here. <laughs> Crispus Atticus, boy of valor. So yeah, I think he was the first person killed in the Revolutionary War. Um, so I did some research. Obviously, I, I'm not ready for an exam. <laughs> But um, some of the books found their way into the pedestals. Some of them found their way onto the shelves. Um, the books on the shelves, just as an aside, is, it's something I really like to do. Like, I, I, don't, I, I love creating a finished piece of art, but I also like the, the spontaneity and the casual gesture of also just having some books on the shelf because it, I, it, I think it, 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 it kind of uh, gives you an insight into the process. Like, yeah, these things, this is a sculpture, but it started out as objects on a shelf. So that's an appealing little game that I like to play. So between my, my jewelry studio, my art studio, my home library, and, um, and Amazon, <laughs> that, that was the, uh, the universe of materials that I had at my disposal. Oh, because of course I had all these the decanters, from Bill's godmother. Um, Bill and I had also, we go antiquing a lot, and the one, the one exception is these figures, those are uh, Galliano liqueur bottles. Um, and behind you, there is one large piece in the vitrine, and that was a store, like a, a store display promoting Galliano liqueur. So Galliano liqueur is an Italian, um, a cordial that's been around since the 1890s, and it was named coincidentally after an Italian war hero, Giuseppe Galliano. So uh, I, at a at a antique market, we had found that tall drink of water, or drink of whiskey, and um, that was a really prized find. You know, I I, I think I bought it, paid a hundred dollars for it, and I was very excited to have it either as decorative as decor in, in my home or maybe one day as a sculpture. So even though he's not a Revolutionary War hero, he fit the kind of ethos of, of the story. And then these smaller ones, which were decanters, everything else is, is pretty much true, but those guys, I made up a story for them. And my story is they're the Galliano brothers, they're Giuseppe's sons. They, they found their way as mercenary soldiers to America and fought in the Revolutionary War, helping uh, America, you know, the, the new nation of America. After the war, they settled in America, but they started to question their militaristic heritage. They went into therapy and <laughs> They became motivational speakers. <laughs> so, there, so there you go. <laughs> um, th there was another inspiration for this whole project, and that was being invited to be the artist in residence here at Hyatt Centric. 
a, a space I had not been to before. But when I first came here and I saw this, uh, this wall of shelving, I, I knew that this was the right project for me because, I mean, again, most of you have been to my home, you know I live in a, in a, in a house full of shelves. Like, this is, it's an old library. This is my sweet spot. And the idea of landscaping the shelves with my art felt really, really comfortable and really good. And it was early enough in the journey of the, the Whiskey uh, Rebellion that I was able to size the pieces to fit exactly, you know, the 18 inch height here, the taller shelves are 20 inches. So the, I was able to make work that would fit here and, and that was still, you know, the, the work, it lent itself to it. The other concern that I had or, or challenge was, well, these are extremely horizontal, you know, 54 inch wide by 18 cubbies. And I knew that the sculptures might look a little you know, lost. They're very vertical, they're, they're very narrow, and I wanted to somehow layer into the conversation something that was more horizontal. So I started thinking about canvases, uh, but I'm not a painter, so I'm like, well, what would I have on the canvases? And then I, I, I thought about camouflage, and camo is a, is a pattern that I have a love-hate relationship with. As a fashion person, I love it, but as a pacifist, I hate it. And I hate that I love it. <laughs> and, and for years, I wouldn't buy anything camo because it just didn't seem right. But um, I gave up, and, and I'm, I'm into camo now. But you know, camo has become a fashion thing, and I feel like my personal journey with it is an expression of that. So getting camo, but getting it in fashion colors, that seemed like a good, you know, a good compromise. So I have pink camo, and beige, and green, and blue, and gray. Once I got the camo, um, I took bleach and I, well, I, I, I ordered stretchers, you know, and made, made everything. I knew that it would be a custom fit. I didn't know at that point if every cubby would have a panel, which was my first mock-up, or just a few. I didn't know if the sculptures would be in front of it or on the wood. Like, I kind of left that up to installation day. I made enough panels so that if I wanted to, every single uh, grid would have had one. And I, and I wanted that opportunity to be spontaneous at the last minute. But the bleach kind of, I liked, I wanted to do something to it. The, Jasper Johns famously said, you know, what is art? Take something, do something to it, do something else to it. And I was thinking about that verbatim with the canvas. So I took something and I did something to it. I splashed, cam, splashed the bleach on it. And then taking it one step further, I actually made finished paintings out of it. So up there, Whiskey Rebellion, the next one, Strong Deeds, Gentle Words, and to the right of it, Love is Love. Those are expressions that came from this show. I mean, Whiskey Rebellion obviously was the name of the show. Strong Deeds, Gentle Words is the motto of the state of Maryland. And that was the family motto of Lord Calvert. And it was in Italian originally, and I, and I read that the original translation of the motto was manly deeds, feminine words, or female words. And um, that, that obviously you know, got challenged eventually. So by the late 20th century, the Maryland state flag had translated that. Actually, I think on the flag, it's still in Italian, but in all of their official literature, it now um, translates to strong deeds, gentle words. Um, love is love is more of a contemporary expression, but I, um, when, I was, when I was looking into it, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, he, excuse me, in his acceptance speech for the Tony for best musical, he talked about love is love is love is love is love. I have a, like a really nice transcript. And it seemed you know, very apt. So I have a list of like 20 different terms that um, came from the research for this show, including the three different bird sculptures, the woodpecker, the bluebird, and the robin. Each bird uh, represents different qualities of uh, you know, goodness and memory and truth and all kinds of different um, sentiments and uh, personality types. And so I, I was writing those things down as well. 
And my plan is over the next year to take the rest of these panels and to turn them into canvases with words as well. And the, the way that I physically did it using stencils is actually another Jasper Johns reference because that's how he puts text into his canvases. And with a very thick kind of painterly uh, gesture, I really I wanted that abstract expressionist hint in there. And, and actually the whole bleach thing is pretty abstract. So just kind of, you know, trying, uh, spreading my wings a little bit and playing with a different medium. And then the, the final piece of it was taking brass and uh, silver plated nail heads in star shapes and pyramids and hearts. Those are the kind of thing that you would stud a leather jacket with or, um, uh, you know, in, in interior design, the trim of a, a piece of furniture. So one of the jewelry companies that I buy components from they they sell them and I bought a whole bunch and you know added that to add some bling and to add a connection between my jewelry and my art which is like my lifelong uh, quest to find ways to uh, layer art and commerce and art, I mean jewelry is an art form as well but for so many years I've tailored it to you know a commercial business that freeing the jewelry of those kinds of constraints and, and bringing that language into art has been you know, so, so gratifying. And I think that this series, partially because of the scale and partially because of you know, the, the um, conceptual premise of it, has allowed me to do it more than ever before. So the, th these are like little jeweled sculptures, but um, you know, for, for a reason. So there you go. <laughs> All right, that's the broad stroke. Thank you. Uh, once you thoughtfully assemble these objects, uh, items, uh, do you affix them permanently or do you allow some time to reflect? Uh, great question. I, I actually, Bill asked me the other day, which piece did you do first? And it might be a little strange, but I worked on all 16 of them at the same time. Because it was, it was almost easier that way because as like I literally have a shelving unit that has bins of objects and I started top left, took down the bin, st sorted through it and you know was picking things up with this worth there, with this worth there, you know, and each and I started creating piles in front of each of the 16 decanters. Um, and slowly but surely building up. And then after a certain point, a month or two into it, some pieces started to take shape faster than others. And, and the show was getting closer and I'm like, I've got to complete something. So at that point, when I felt really confident about the composition, I started adhering things. And, um, and once I adhered it, you know, I, I could still make changes if I really wanted to. But by the time I got to the adhering, I was feeling like, you know, intuitively pretty good about those pieces. So, and everything worked in that nice paced out way until the very end. And the last piece, uh, which I finished literally the day before uh, our opening this week, uh, I, I will admit I got my hot glue gun and just did a few last minute things that otherwise wouldn't have made it in time. <laughs> But can the books still be read? No, no. Oh. The books, I, um, That's my only I, I varnished the sides of them so that my concern was not when I install it, but, you know, if, these, if and when these pieces leave my control, I want them to be as durable as possible and to have, you know, open books with pages flying. Like, you wouldn't know where to lift it or hold it. So I thought it was important to try to contain them as much as possible. I love, 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 that love is love <laughs> is on a material that symbolizes war and the military. Touche. I mean, that's, that's just yeah. beautiful. Thank you. And I have to say, until now, I didn't really get Hamilton. You know, I thought these founders of our country were such racist. Mm -hmm. Why would uh, non-white Americans want to portray them? But I guess they're, they're taking them back and recontextualizing them. Exactly. You are. And I don't know why I didn't get that before. I always love the music, but I right. get the theme of it. And I, I love that you're doing that with this. Thank you. How ironic it is that how, how long was this after the Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party, that 
the, the new U.S. imposed a tax on whiskey after it's drinking so much <laughs> to the tax yeah. on tea. Yeah, really crazy. However, there was taxation with representation by then, but not for women and not for anybody but white men. Right. And not for Washington, D.C. Yeah, but yeah, right. And not for what? Washington, D.C. Oh, right, right. Still. Still. Still, Still. right. But yeah. How interesting that it started here in what is now the cradle of mega, the mega. <laughs> Alicia, yeah. I'm just interested. Can you like just for one better word dissect one piece and tell us like about sure. the person who they are and what you did to it to represent what you learned about? Is there a piece that you're particularly I curious know, about? I, I, huh. I don't know. I'm kind of gonna lead it to your just Okay, I'm gonna talk about Thomas Jefferson. Great. That's a good one right there. So yeah, Thomas Jefferson is a complex character that I I didn't know a lot about. Hamilton taught me some things that I, that I didn't know. So he was, um, in addition to being our third president, prior to that, he was the US ambassador to France. And um, according to the musical Hamilton, he was a bit of a dandy and, and a real Francophile. And um, you know, not necessarily the kind of guy you'd want to have a beer with, um, which, which made him a little suspect. He was a coastal elite. Um, he also was a slave, uh, you know, he, he owned enslaved people, to use the right terminology. He had uh, that very problematic relationship with Sally Hemings, uh, who was one of the enslaved people in his property. So, and yet he's a hero, and he's, you know, he, he's the, um, actually I can tell you exactly. He is the 10th most represented uh, figure in, in monuments in the United States. And I know that because in Philadelphia, we have this incredible nonprofit organization called Monument Lab. And Monument Lab's role over the past five years has been to first do an analysis of the, the state of monuments in America. And one of the things they did was this audit of the top 50 most represented uh, characters, uh, uh, not characters, historical people um, in monuments around the country. So Jefferson was number 10. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's kind of amazing. And again, it questions, well, all of these challenging factors are just, have just been ignored throughout history. So I, um, I'm really into Monument Lab, and I went to a fundraiser that they did recently. And there was a table of swag as you were leaving. And among the, the objects were these buttons that said, monuments must change. Well, the timing was brilliant because I was, I had this little pedestal and I was looking for the right thing to put on it. And this was one of the last pieces to be completed because that little stand was, was bare. And when I grabbed that Monuments Must Change button, I didn't know exactly that night, but the next day when I was at the studio, I'm like, oh my God, this is the answer. And then I even took their audit, photocopied it, and cut out just the line that said number, you know, number 10, Hamilton, and how many sculptors? 37, I think. 36. And um, I decoupaged that to the plaque. So there's just like a little bit of a, you know, a histor historical approach. Um, Jefferson's necklace is made out of cowrie shells, which represent the African slave trade. There is a, this is, um, a tool that you use for when you're smoking pipes to, to press down the tobacco. So that was in reference to his plantations. Uh, red, white, and blue beads referencing our country. This is a 1976 charm. And I thought, you know, a little patriotic moment. He's wearing a Virginia is for lovers button, which is meant to be ironic. Uh, he, he was certainly a lover, but I don't think that's what the state tourist board you know, had in mind. <laughs> um, he's also got a women's rights or human rights button. Again, ironic considering his history. A support LGBTQ button. And actually, guns do kill people button. Um, and then a little uh, button of a sheep. Uh, we had an event at my studio, and there was a woman there who represents a line of uh, beauty products made from sheep's milk. And she gave Bill and me both these little uh, swag bags and there was a little button. It was, do you remember the name of the brand? The Beekman Boys, these guys who Martha Stewart made famous. So there's a Beekman Boys goat button there. Again, kind of a, ca a casual uh, farming reference. 
Um, the Champagne Bollinger box is a reference to his time in France. The uh, quarters are against the state quarters that um, represent different countries. So these were Virginia state quarters. The lighter is a Tom Sachs lighter. Tom Sachs is a contemporary artist who's uh, a real favorite of mine. And he has this kind of wonky improvisational approach to sculpture making that has had a lot of influence on my own sculpture making. So. It was enough that his name is Tom and Thomas Jefferson's name is Tom that I saw, you know, there was a connection there. Um, the iPhone 6 was, you know, that's bringing it to the 21st century. And of course, Jefferson would have had an iPhone 14 plus by now, but I don't have one. So I wasn't, I didn't have the box to devote to the sculpture. And then this uh, globe, it's, you know, kind of speaking about global politics. Um, but also, th this so happens to be an Avon bottle, another whole category of collectible um, bottles that Bill's godmother had. <laughs> so that's where I got it from. And then finally, the bunny is also, well, the bunny is both a reference to, um, you know, to, na to nature and to Monticello and his farming, but also to the, you know, the, the, the uh, reputation that bunnies have for procreating a lot. So there you go. That's you. that, <laughs> that dissects it. Oh, <laughs> sure. Lord Lord Calvert is from a hundred and some years prior to the Revolutionary War. He was a, um, a much decorated in in uh, in Britain. Um, in the sixteen, let's say sixteen sixties or so. Um, and then had the opportunity to come to the American colonies where he founded eventually uh, the first um, colony for free Catholics, and that was Maryland. Um, his, he died shortly after it was officially founded, but then his son and his son's son, they all became the governors of Maryland. So there's a very strong association between Calvert, freedom, Catholicism, Maryland, um, so he's a bit of a maverick and, you know, I, and, and a well-respected character, I'm told, by some who, who know him and, and, and like him as well. And so his, uh, the objects here include references to Maryland itself. The, this, was the, this was the Calvert family flag that eventually became the Calvert family um, crest that became the Maryland flag. There's a little shot glass here, a little whiskey reference that's a Maryland souvenir some seashells referencing uh, Maryland's coastal location, uh, a book from my business bookshelf, The Art of Being Unreasonable. Uh, I, like, I liked that idea. Uh, a Maryland quarter, a uh, cross rep representing his Catholicism and a big C for either Calvert or Catholic. Um, and then this guy, you know, the, the fashions of the 1600s were really flamboyant and men were the dandies. So he is just with the, you know, the tights and the bloomers and this big picture hat. So I thought he would like a big brooch. So I, I had this big rhinestone brooch that became the centerpiece. And then I used that to add even more things, a Black Lives Matter button, a Victorian eye pin because that was a you know a reference to uh, back to back to Britain and uh, the, the secret portraits lover you would wear a, a portrait of your lover's eye was a Victorian era um, conceit that, and uh, I had seen a show about that once and this was a button from the gift shop I think at the Victorian Albert Museum and then a much more contemporary reference, Baltimore's most famous uh, son in some ways, in some circles, is John Waters, the filmmaker uh, who did Pink Flamingos and uh, Hairspray and many others. So on Amazon, I bought a John Waters enameled button to add to Lord Calvert's uh, ensemble. This is a Microsoft camera that was something that my father gave me from some earlier iteration of his uh, his computer setup. I like the idea that it was both the kind of surveillance and also, again, these obsolete technologies that just keep changing. And, you know, if Calvert was around today, that's probably, you know, at one point he would have had that or something similar. There's some anchors on the books. 
there, at the bottom is just a beautiful old leather bound book that I, I put there for, uh, to, to um, anchor it in history and it just gave it texture. And then finally, these are little um, American Indian, uh, it was from a bracelet, little um, silver buttons. And so that's speaking to the uh, Maryland, I mean, he didn't invent or he didn't discover Maryland. It wasn't unpopulated. There was a whole other population of first people that we don't, you know, that, that gets ignored in these, you know, Wikipedia. If you Google Lord Calvert, it doesn't really talk about, you know, who was there before. So that's, again, I just want to, re to remind everybody that, you know, this, that history is complicated. And also, you would have, if you mentioned the tattooing that some of Oh, yeah, thank you. Another way of, of bringing um, the 21st century and my own uh, interests into these figures was through tattoos. So using uh, gold pens, I, when you come afterwards, have a drink, come take a look, and you can see I used, um, I tattooed most of their hands with, um, you know, kind of old, old school sailor tattoos, arrows and hearts and daggers and banners. Um, and then on some of them, like these two, this was a competing whiskey company, Ezra Brooks Whiskey, and they, their theme was more like uh, the circus characters, the strong man, the boxer. So there was a lot of naked flesh on these guys, and I tattooed their, their bodies, but using brass stampings, which was from my jewelry uh, business. But yeah, t I, I really liked the idea of tattooing them as well. Yes, Barbara. Okay, so I've got three things for you. One is a history thing, one is a whiskey thing, and one is a camel design thing. Okay. So historically, what I find so interesting about that Victorian eye, that uh, yeah. secret eye, is that the reason Calvert lasted so long and held office so long, even though he was a positive Catholic and rampantly Protestant in England, is because he was so good at camouflaging his own identity. So uh -huh. I, I thought that was just brilliant. So take credit for that one. Yes, uh, I knew that. Yes. <laughs> if these are decanters, was that like a fifth of whiskey was actually in them? And if so, where do you pour them? Yeah. So yeah. Are, they, are they really decanters or are they really? And if so, is that a fifth and that's a magnum? Or what, what that one was definitely just a store display. So that's not a vessel. But the others are almost all vessels. In, mo in most cases, the hat or the head came off, and the body was filled with whiskey. Yeah, I think at the waist of the boxer, I yep. think certain men's birds' heads, I think. But it's a good question. Were they decanters in that they were meant to be refilled, or was it more of a novelty? I'm guessing more the, the, the novelty. Yeah. And my favorite story for you is about a camel. Um, I was at Fortuity about three years ago, and I was slipping through the wings, and they had a very, very, very elaborate, incredible uh, turn of the last century, like 1910 fabrics. But they, they always bring out their lines, and one was camel. But how weird. I'm looking at lime green, and purple, and hot pink. And it's huh. called Camo Azola. So they were islands. And I asked, I asked the people in the show, what do you mean by islands? Why are they islands? And they do look a little like islands. Yeah. They said they hated the references to Camo, but they loved the pattern. So they picked up the outline of the island from which each one of their very, very, very long term designers was from the Dominican Republic, wherever it was. And those are the camos, uh -huh. the islands of the people who helped build their, their company. That's very cool. It's just, yeah. Well, wow, this was from a um, more like for hunting gear or, you know, just vinyl coated camo uh, fabric. Yeah. Yes, Jim. You know, if I were just walking through, I would much appreciate the aesthetic, but I would not know, probably not notice any of the embellishments mm. that you've added with meaning. Uh, is there some way that that can be, that can uh, accompany the artwork itself? Well, the, I do have a little, this is more historical, telling about who is each person. And then there is a QR code here and these takeaway postcards. This gives a little bit of what I'm talking about. 
And then the QR code takes you to my website where you can see each figure. Um, so somehow between that, if somebody's really interested, you know, they can find out. But I think that that's just the nature of the beast, that when you're making art that has a conceptual layer, people are going to interpret it in different ways. You know, ideally there's an aesthetic um, aspect that's satisfying in its own right. And then if you're curious and you want to dig further, there's another, there's another layer. Yeah. And then, you'll have a video. and then we'll have a video on our website, right? On my website. Well, thank yes, Gavi. Is there a reason that you picked, uh, I think, 16, was it? Um, like, figures to do? Like, does that number have any standards, or was it just, like, how many you wanted to do? Um, it was how many bottles I had that felt uh, like they logically connected to this body of work. I have some other decanters that I took, an Eiffel Tower, um, you know, some other unrelated things that, you know, I'll use them at some point. But in terms of the Whiskey Rebellion, I used everything that I had. Um, short of, I have two more of the Galliano brothers, little mini ones. And um, I didn't do them yet because I knew that they would be a little, little small for these shelves. And, but at some point, you know, I will make them, yeah. And it's actually 16 here and one there, so 17 pieces total. Yeah. I like that you did a mix of the, of the camo and leaving the, the wood background, too, because that kind of has a rec room ish kind of feel to it. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I have um, a default uh, to, towards symmetry. And so, but I know that that's like the easy way out. So I'm always pushing myself in my design to go asymmetrical. So when I, when I was installing it here, I just kept, you know, shoving things to the left or to the right and go, no, don't do that. And then I had, for, for 25 minutes, it was a checkerboard. So every other cubby had camo. I'm like, I did it again. <laughs> So ultimately, um, the, the asymmetry of it and the kind of, it, I just felt like it does make it more dynamic and, uh, and, and the, the pieces can breathe and, you know, there's busy moments, but then there's calmer moments. Uh, and yeah, that rec room reference. I mean, this wood is really, there's a, the warmth. When I first took some photos of it, I was kind of surprised because it didn't pop. It's very warm. It's very residential looking, like a living room. And now I'm just uh, accepting that that's, you know, the nature of this installation. And again, to see it really clearly on my website, the photos are stark against a white background. So you all, you, you see every single detail. Here, it's thinking of it more as an installation. And just a quick shout out. The very first time I showed my art in public was an installation that Marsha curated. It was... Um, these diptychs using a shopping bag on one side and then a collage of my ephemera on the other installed in a, a vacant store window at Liberty Place. And, and that installation also, like there was what you could see it in one way in the window, but then in a very different way looking at it up close. So that's just the nature of installations, right? And that, uh, and that was in 2011. So I've, o I've only been um, showing my art publicly. This is, you know, 11 years now. So, and you gave me my start. <laughs> Thank you.